All right. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for being a part of this today. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, an EMS EMS in history topic. So, um, David, are you, are you familiar with uh, Governor William Goble, the thirty fourth governor of Kentucky? In broad strokes, I am uh, I'm aware that he is. I think maybe just one of uh, two or three governors who's ever been assassinated, and I think he was only governor for like twelve hours, something like that. Yeah, is there's quite the story behind it, and uh, um, I would I uh, figured that you would uh, enjoy this so much that uh, I went ahead and spoke for you here, and assume that that was fine to put up there. <clears throat> um, so. Uh, folks, what we're going to do today is talk about a bit of history. I, th I think some bits of history are kind of cool. And uh, let me get uh, myself on here. Didn't realize there. There we go. Hey, um, <clears throat> some bits of history are really cool, but also there are some learning points that we can kind of take forward to it. So um, if you remember my death of Rasputin thing, this will be uh, sort of a scaled down version of that because there's not as much to tell. Uh, but I will ask uh, Professor Pfeiffer, who is the, again, the program direct program director um, at uh, EKU's paramedic program, which uh, is a, a pretty cool setup. Um, <clears throat> he uh, will join me in uh, chiming in for some of this stuff. But uh, Dave, let's, let's talk about uh, the story I've got here. So <clears throat> imagine this, it is uh, 1900. Um, <clears throat> the governor of Kentucky has been inaugurated while lying on his deathbed a day after he was shot in the chest. His opponent, who was the actual winner of the election, and was actually inaugurated two months before that, um, remains holed up in his office in the state building, heavily protected by an armed militia. <clears throat> the Democrat Majority Congress of Kentucky is actually meeting not in the state capitol, which has been barred by that same militia, uh, but in a building in Frankfurt, uh, otherwise in the, in the city building. <clears throat> the Republicans in the state legislature uh, are meeting in London, Kentucky which is a Republican area, uh, and both claim to be the legitimate seat of power in the state. The Kentucky state militia was called up by the now deposed Republican um, uh, governor. Um, they have been ordered to disband as the first act of the newly now dying governor lying in his bed. Another rival militia has formed and is uh, stationing itself on the Capitol grounds. And then thousands of armed mountain men who don't really belong to any faction one way or another uh, from the outreaches of the state are stalking around the Capitol. Civil war is at hand, and then the governor dies. Wow, that's quite a story. Um, did any, if you were out there, did, did anybody realize this was a thing? Uh, and we sort of maybe have heard a little rumor about it, but this was an actual thing that happened not that long ago in Kentucky, in right old little old Kentucky here. Uh, so so hopefully, the first thing is this actually sounds a lot like Kentucky currently, and also um, people should probably know um, I, I am a Kentucky Colonel. Uh, the Honorable Order of the Kentucky Colonels is the honorary bodyguard of the state governor. Uh, we actually train for the scenario uh, on a biweekly basis, uh, kind of hush hush. We don't put a lot of pictures up on the gram, um, but be out there, all right? You, you shoot at a Kentucky Colonel, you best not miss. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> I also am a Colonel. Nice to see you, Colonel. Um, right. So a little bit of background here. Um, William Goebel, 34th Governor of Kentucky. His term lasted from January 31st to February 3rd, 1900. This guy was kind of a rising star in the Kentucky Democratic Party. He was a Democrat. He had been in Congress for two years before that. Uh, he didn't make a whole lot of like law or that sort of thing, but uh, he became famous for being a great politician. And mostly he kind of busted the railroads, uh, especially the L&N Railroad, which is Louisville, Nashville. But mostly he got uh, famous for being sort of a, a populist, but also for doing whatever was needed to keep him in politics and get him more power. So this this dude was literally as slimy as, as about you can get. There was nothing that he wasn't willing to do, no deal he wasn't willing to make and then break if it personally benefited him in one way or another. Uh, he was remarked as having the appearance of a reptile. Uh, they said he had contemptuous lips, a sharp nose, and humorless eyes. Uh, and he wasn't a very good public speaker. He was pretty plain spoken. It didn't have a lot of flowery energy. He just had a really loud voice and he yelled. And that was how he made the points. So 
consummate politician William Goebel. Goebel's strength, like I said, was in making deals and stabbing people in the back. He really didn't do a whole lot in terms of actual policy uh, outside of making people mad other than kill a uh, man in an unofficial duel by shooting him in the head over a newspaper story. But politically, he was on a rocket to the top. He was a rising star. He was the, uh, God, I don't want to call him the Obama of 1899, but he was maybe the AOC of 1899 and and had as many detractors uh, in 1899. Here's the story of how Goebel got to where he was, uh, at least the the governorship. This is a little bit complicated here. Stick with me. 1899, it is a governor's race. And in Kentucky, there's William Taylor, who is running as a Republican, and he's essentially like the only only meaningful candidate from the Republican Party. On the Democrat side, though, there is Goebel, there's a guy named Watt Harden, and a guy named William Stone. Harden is the front runner, but Goebel and Stone say, we cannot have this guy be governor. And so these these three are all Democrats, keep in mind. So Goebel and Stone get together, and Goebel makes a deal with Stone and says, I'll pledge my delegates to you, I'll tell them to vote for you, because it'll mean that Harden will win, Stone will go on to get the nomination, and then Goebel will get to pick a bunch of people on the ballot, otherwise like a bunch of other positions. And so they say, okay, this sounds good. Uh, Harden, it sounds, it looks like this is going forth. Uh, Harden gets word of it and says, well, I can't beat both of them, and Harden drops out. So now it's Goebel and Stone. Goebel sees this and basically reneges on his offer, and his supporters don't vote for Stone anymore. They, they stick with Goebel because now he knows that he can beat Stone. Uh, Harden actually learns about this and finds out, oh, it's still contested, tries to jump back in. The supporters are now kind of like split up between the three. What eventually happens is that Stone gets dropped out as the uh, lowest of the three, and Harden and Goebel eventually go at it, and Harden will eventually go away as well. And that leaves just Goebel to take on William Taylor in the governor's election outright. This, This is all just leading up to it at this point. Incidentally, another Democrat faction actually sort of based out of Lexington instead of like basing itself out of Frankfurt, uh, nominates another candidate and calls themselves like the fair election Democrat. So they actually have another candidate who is going to, uh, who they're going to put up for governor, but he never actually gets like the true Democrat nomination. So the election finally takes place and it goes, okay. Taylor wins, uh, 193,714 to 191,331, uh, which is about 2,400 votes. And this appears to be legitimate. Taylor is sworn in on December 12th. Uh, So he's inaugurated. He's the governor now. Goebel pretty much is willing to concede. uh, But his fellow Democrats contest the election and sort of force him into uh, doing the same. So they make these allegations that there's voter fraud. They take it to the election commission saying that the ballots like in one area and that was a Republican stronghold. uh, Well, these ballots said like uh, William P. Taylor instead of William S. Taylor or something like that. And so they can't count. And then in another another Republican heavy area, they say, well, these ballots were printed on too thin a paper. No joke. The election commission, despite the fact that Goebel like built it, put it together and put the people on it, uh, surprises everyone and says, well, we don't actually have the ability to set aside this election. It has to be the General Assembly. So the Democrat majority General Assembly is going to get together and assuredly vote that Goebel wins the election because that's what you do if you are the uh, the majority party and you have the, the ability to decide who wins an election. So it's the morning of January 30th and Taylor is still governor and the election is in dispute and Goebel and two bodyguards are walking to the old state capitol when all of a sudden five or six shots rang out from the nearby building which on the right in this picture here and Goebel falls shot in the chest. He is taken to a nearby hotel uh, where he's still alive and talking at that point, although there was some concern that maybe he had actually died uh, when he hit the ground. (laughs) So Goebel's been shot. He is in this hotel, now responsive and being cared for by a doctor. So here's his shirt. You can see the wound to the right chest uh, just above the nipple on the kind of lateral aspect. And there's his coat on the left, the exit wound in in the left back. He's still awake and talking at this point, and he delivers a few words and sort of indicates he's maybe not so bad after all. So he's uh, alive. He's taken to this doctor who does realize this is a mortal wound. 
So Goebel is still alive. Taylor is still the governor, but that's not going to last for long. Taylor declares the state in a state of insurrection, and the Kentucky militia has been ordered up for the last month because when rumors of this started talking, uh, Taylor calls him up because there, there's likely to be unrest. So not all that strange, but he orders the Kentucky militia into action, and he calls the legislature into special session, but he says, it is too dangerous to meet in Frankfurt. We need to go to London, Kentucky, where he believes it will be safer, where it was strongly a Republican area. The Democrats see this, and they say, hell no, we won't go. And instead, they hold their own meeting in the Frankfurt City Hall, and they vote to disqualify just enough votes to make Goebel the governor uh, that night. So back at the Capitol Hotel, the Chief Justice of the Kentucky Supreme Court rushes back to the Capitol and swears in Goebel on January 31st. Now, this is a day after he's shot. Some people report that he's already dead when he is quote-unquote sworn in. But uh, he appears to have probably lived on for uh, about four days or so after being shot. Goebel's first and only act is to issue a proclamation disbanding the militia that was called up by Taylor. The Republican commander of the militia, however, refuses, and the Gatling guns remain on the state house lawn. Democrat militiamen form their own militia and begin massing as well. So now there are two governors, two lieutenant governors, two attorney generals, and two state assemblies, and each one claims to be the, the seat of power in Kentucky. This story, you wish it really had a more climactic ending, but mostly there's a lot of tense time until Goebel dies. He dies on February 3rd at 6.44 p.m. His last words were reported according to someone who stumbled down to the few reporters that were left several hours after his death outside the hotel, and they say that he said, tell my friends to be brave, fearless, and loyal to the common people. And that's what you see on like his tombstone, and that's what is all attributed to him. You'll notice that his picture softens up as time goes on as well. That's sort of a questionable interpretation at best. And uh, what's more thought to be more likely that he said was that he said, Doc, that was a damn bad oyster. Because he... So now Goebel is dead, but he's been inaugurated. Uh, and so his lieutenant governor, Breckenridge, is thought to be more palatable to the Republicans. And we find out at this point that things just sort of peter out. Uh, the Republicans eventually come to a compromise with the Democrats, and they'll say, uh, Republicans say, we'll stop contesting the election if you offer immunity for anybody who may have been involved with the assassination. Democrats say, well, okay, that sounds okay to us, because they'll still be the governor. Everybody's a little bit happier with Breckenridge as the governor uh, rather than Goebel, so it's, it's really just picking the, getting rid of that guy. And after he dies, all the tensions just kind of ease. Interestingly enough, Taylor, the, the deposed Republican governor, actually runs to Indianapolis, where the governor of Indiana refuses to extradite him when he is thought to be involved with the, uh, with the assassination plot. Eventually, everybody involved, even those who might have been convicted of something, will get pardoned within about a decade. Um, and we never really will know who actually fired the uh, fatal shot that killed Governor William Goebel, the 34th governor of Kentucky. A couple of quick observations. The first is, uh, you know, being something of a student of uh, political history, uh, stories like this kind of do always remind me that, um, you know, we, we've lived through pretty turbulent political times before with some real, you know, honest to God violence, um, and that the, the union tends to endure and, you know, our systems of government tend to persist. And, uh, you know, life eventually kind of moves on. The pendulums swing back and forth kind of continuously on an arc, you know, throughout history. And so uh, just some helpful perspective, I think, in the troubled times that we're living in. Um, and then the second thing is, why didn't they ever take any of these people to actual hospitals? Like hospitals existed, doctor's offices definitely existed, but like Lincoln, Garfield, Goebel, it was like, basically, if you got hurt between, you know, the beginning of the country and like 1930, they were just going to take you to a hotel. And I mean, they obviously had a way to get him from where he got shot to the hotel. And it just seems like taking them to an actual hospital would not be that much of a stretch. And uh, that's just very strange to me. 
It is. So uh, interestingly enough, the, at the Capitol Hotel, um, the doctor that treated him actually had his office there, um, like in one of the rooms. So his friend back. I just said. Eh, it's still not a hot. He still stayed in the hotel room until he died. <clears throat> um, but uh, but yes, uh, in- interesting perspective on like where things kind of uh, went at the time. How did he how did he get there? Well, they didn't call EMS. There was no EMS. Uh, his friends literally picked him up and dragged him in there. So. Hey, that that actually does raise a little bit of a, another point for me, though, which is that I think a lot of times um, when we are talking about the uh, woes of the EMS system and, 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 you know, sometimes what I think we would all agree are kind of shortcomings, you hear people say EMS is a young profession, it's a young system, and I think what they're really talking about there is that compared to institutions like medicine and nursing and maybe some other healthcare roles, you know, uh, EMS, as we know it today, really didn't get organized until like 1970. Um, I've always hated that line for a couple of reasons. The first is PAs didn't exist until 1970s either. And we all know the different trajectories of PAs versus paramedics and kind of where we sit with that today. But then the other thing is that it's not true. So when people say EMS is a young profession, what they're really talking about is modern EMS with the National Registry and 911 and triple K ambulance standards and all that kind of stuff. But in reality, the concept of people with specialized knowledge going to the side of somebody who got injured, providing initial care, and then moving them to a place of definitive care um, is actually really old and dates, uh, you know, at least back to uh, what Jean-Jacques Larray and all that sort of stuff. But, but in reality, here in America, the first ambulance-based system was organized, I think, in 1856 in uh, New York City from Bellevue Hospital. Um, And then after the Civil War, you saw a few of these things pop up in a few other places like Cincinnati. And that kind of explains Cincinnati's long history with EMS and the first EMS residency and all that kind of stuff. And I believe that that was somewhere around 1896. I might be getting my dates kind of mixed up on this. I probably should know better. But but the point is, like, you can find pictures of horse-drawn wagons that say ambulance on the side with a medical attendant staffing them. And it sounds like we didn't really have this in Frankfort, Kentucky, but EMS is not a young profession. EMS goes back, you know, a, a couple hundred years. Cool. Yeah, they did not have an ambulance available to take <clears throat> take uh, Governor Goebel any place at that point. He laid in bed for the next couple of days and on January 3rd, or sorry, February 3rd at 6.44 p.m., Goebel dies. His reported last words, as espoused by someone who went down a couple hours later to the few reporters that happened to be massing outside the, uh, the hotel still, <clears throat> was that he said, tell my friends to be brave, fearless, and loyal to the common people. A spectator who was in the room said he ate an oyster and then said, doc, that was a damned bad oyster. And that was the last thing he said. I love it. Perspective. Yeah. You'll notice that uh, Goebel's picture softens quite a bit, uh, as well as uh, the farther removed we get from his death. <clears throat> so um, at this point, things kind of peter out. The governor has died. Um, and this is a picture of the, the crowd amassing for his funeral there. However, Him doing so is probably the thing that more or less saves the state from uh, civil war, though, because everything just kind of peters out after that. Uh, The mountain men all go home. The militias eventually disband. The Republicans work out a deal. They start to work out a deal with the Democrats and say, like, okay, we'll you can have your guy. We'll stop. uh, We'll stop. um, um, Stop running, you know, Taylor against. We'll we'll say that you can you won the election. but we want immunity for everybody that for anybody that may have been involved with the assassination itself. Um, And the Democrats actually say, okay, Taylor though, who was the governor says, no, I'm not going to do that. Doesn't want any part of it and flees to Indiana uh, who refuses to extradite him, which is an interesting thing. So uh, he spends a lot more time in Indianapolis for a while living safely. Eventually there will be some people that are arrested but everyone basically gets pardoned within about 10 years of it. So no one really knows exactly who fired the killing shot. Uh, They think maybe Taylor was involved with it. They think maybe the attorney general and a couple of other high folks like in the party, not just, not just some, you know, guy they found on the street, but they think maybe it was actually uh, those guys that did it, but we will never actually know. 
and the true killer was never actually found. So again, everything just kind of peters out after that. Gobel dies, everybody goes back to kind of normal. Weird, huh? And again, this is this is 100 years ago. Um, <clears throat> your grand great-grandparents may have heard about this. Heck, even some people's grandparents may have been alive for that. So my question is, that's the story of the deposed governor, the first, uh, the only governor ever to actually die in office in the United States. Um, but uh, David, could you have saved him? Do you think that there's something we could have done uh, to maybe prevent that had an established EMS system been available? <clears throat> yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so first of all, I'd like to point out, I basically do the same thing as a doctor, except at eight miles an hour. Uh, secondly, yep. if I had been working on a horse-drawn wagon at the time, I would have been doing the same thing as a doctor, but at about one mile an hour. Um, so yeah, I just would have done some doctor shit and, you know, yep. Obviously some pretty significant thoracic trauma there from what it looked like from the entrance and the exit wound, but, yeah. um, clamshell thoracotomy just right there, uh, in the dirt on the lawn, damage control resuscitation, be aggressive with your medicine. I'm going to say a few other terms that don't necessarily make sense right now. Um, something, something TXA, uh, blah, blah, blah. They had horses back then. So I'm assuming they had ketamine. So we could have sedated him pretty nicely and um, it would have been fine. No. So um, yeah, I mean, could I have saved him? I don't know. I mean, I think we all know what we would have done for that kind of an injury if we were the people responding to it and it would have started with. Well, we'll, we'll talk about it too. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll stop there. Oh, you're good. <clears throat> This was, we didn't rehearse this enough. Sorry, guys. <laughs> and by that, I said, hey, David, can you sign on? And he's like, yeah, okay. Um, and didn't know what he was getting into. So uh, Goebel said, uh, reportedly, if anybody can get over a wound like this, I can. And I think I'll pull through right before he died. So let's, uh, let's take the scenario <clears throat> uh, about what you might do here. So um, for paramedic Pfeiffer, you and an EMT partner are dispatched out to a 44-year-old male gunshot wound to the chest. Uh, it is January 30, uh, 31st. He is awake and breathing, and the scene looks something like this. Note the flashing ambulance lights on the building. <clears throat> so what kind of considerations when you're called out for this, what kind of considerations are you thinking? Uh, you know, male shot in the chest in the middle of January. Um, what, what are you thinking right now on your way to the scene in your horse, on your horse? Stage for the night watchman. Fair enough. Yeah, no. Um, so, you know, considerations are going to be, oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we can all make hay of the same scene safety, you know, uh, stage for PD sort of thing, but but it, it is it is true that you have to uh, be able to operate safely on a scene to be effective, and uh, I doubt very seriously we had any sort of uh, rescue task force kinds of a training or, you know, concepts back then and everything. On the other hand, I would also have to think that... Um, gunshots of this nature and some sporadic violence and dueling and stuff like that um, was not necessarily uncommon back then. Um, and so maybe this was actually a fairly routine kind of a situation for uh, the first responders of the day. But you got to make sure that, you know, you don't become either a second victim or contribute to um, more chaos rather than trying to reduce the chaos. So you're saying BSI scene safe? Jazz hands. <laughs> Always start with jazz hands. <laughs> exactly. And I think it is as, as a, you know, very put exactly right. Um, but I think sometimes we sort of say this, and I do this all the time, like, um, you know, what is that? What are the true um, potential injuries that are out there? What are the dangers for you? Like the guy just got shot from a window uh, from a building next door. Um, do we do we have to worry? Is that guy still there? Nobody else is getting shot so far, but that's an absolutely important thing. Don't forget too about just like stepping out of the ambulance into traffic, which we see folks, it, honestly, see folks do more than we probably should. Um, <clears throat> watch out for all that stuff. So, all right. Uh, so we've made, we're gonna make sure the scene is safe though. The constables and the militia are all there uh, and it is as safe as we think we're gonna have to be. Um, any other thoughts on on considerations as you're drive, as you're, um, horseback riding there in the cold January morning. Yeah, it, I mean, it's cold. So you're going to want to be thinking about um, it, in addition to environmental hypothermia and depending on how long he was laying there and laying on the ground and so forth. Um, also just the idea of uh, hypothermia incidental to trauma, 
which can take place on the warmest and muggiest of days, uh, especially if somebody's losing a lot of blood. So we already want to be thinking about a game plan for getting this guy warm very quickly. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, <clears throat> it is on that day in history, it, or sorry, in um, it was about 40 degrees or so. The high was 40 degrees. This is kind of morning, so it was probably like mid-30s at that point. Um, <clears throat> and so it, I am a big fan of saying, treat the patient, you know, on the scene, treat them where you find them. That's why your stuff has handles. So you take them, uh, you take the stuff to the patient. Um, in this case, though, this guy's lying out in a, a courtyard uh, in the middle of January with a potentially significant injury. His ambient temp or his body temperature is going to drift toward ambient temperature, which is going to kill him. Uh, so we're going to have to move pretty quick. <clears throat> um, maybe a March assessment, uh, any immediate li immediate life saving things. But this is the one time where I would say get him the hell off the scene. I at least get him into an ambulance where it's warm, um, <clears throat> or maybe in this case next to a fire, uh, whatever you've built. All right, so we have actually arrived. Um, how would you go about assessing the patient that's? listed in this uh in this thing here what would be your general principle so you you mentioned the march algorithm uh which i think makes a lot of sense here and i think it really is basically equivalent to xabcde it's really just a different way of packaging the same information and you know you can sort of have a debate about which one conveys the information more accurately but those really are the priorities so for this kind of a patient um probably that, you know, massive uh, hemorrhage for March or exsanguination for XABCDE is going to be a prime consideration. Nothing else you do is really going to be that effective for this patient if he's losing his blood volume. Uh, so probably looking at that. And then obviously just kind of going through the rest of that algorithm. And then I think what's in um, what's really important for people to kind of understand is that when you get into like respiration or breathing, uh, depending on which algorithm you're going down, you know, plug those holes in the patient's chest, um, you know, put occlusive dressings over them. Um, and uh, that is both a respiratory consideration um, and, and I think also kind of a circulatory consideration in the sense of preventing obstructive shock from your tension pneumo or whatever else might be going on. Absolutely agree. Uh, <clears throat> I am, I think we spend too much time together. Um, the, my big question, penetrating trauma. I mean, I mean in, in full disclosure to everybody, you literally are my medical director. So <clears throat> in penetrating trauma, how many holes and where are they? And how many, how many holes that are not supposed to be there are there on the body? Um, I think you have to find that out. And that involves, you know, kind of jump into the, the exposure part before you, uh, do a whole lot else, because <clears throat> a lot of what you're going to do is going to be predicated on where are the holes? Um, and what are they doing? Uh, so that's, you got to jump to like, we are actually, we need to get these patients clothes off. We need to get them essentially naked to know where that they are actually wounded at uh, so that we can manage their hemorrhage. So we can manage their uh, potential respiratory compromise uh, if he's shot in the back. So like this guy, um, I, don't, I don't know if you can see it real well. The hole itself is right here. Uh, so kind of right on his axilla, <clears throat> uh, sorry, other side. Um, right just kind of above his nipple that's uh, a ronald that's reagan injury oh what is it, is it? yeah didn't yeah so ronald reagan basically got shot in the same place in very similar circumstances and i suspect that both of these guys were perhaps waving at a crowd uh with an arm up when they got shot and i think this also highlights the need to be very very thorough when you're doing your blood sweep in your trauma patients and think about the nuance of that technique. So the technique that we teach our students at Eastern is to basically use uh, rakes or bear paws, depending on how you like to think of that, when you're doing your blood sweep so that your fingers will catch any sort of penetrating wounds um, rather than sort of flat hands glossing right over them. Uh, because a lot of times your little w penetrating wounds, whether they're gunshots or stab wounds, will be fairly small, especially on the you know entrance of a gunshot. Um, and they can be up in little nooks and crannies, like right up in the axilla or um, under folds of tissue um, or things of that nature. And you really got to sort of get in there and find them uh, while continuing to move quickly. Yeah, absolutely. That's, I, I have not seen that before, but that's a, that's a great thought. I'm going to start doing that, actually. <clears throat> um, cool. I'm learning something. Here's, here's his shirt again, again, where he kind of shot at uh, while you sit up right there. So pretty small little hole here. And uh, if we zoom in, you might be able to see it a little bit better. Uh, that could be 
you know, held up by his uh, arm. <clears throat> if he, especially if he's going something like that, if he's got his arm kind of turned over, you may not even see that little hole to start off with. The other thing that we have seen happen before patients brought in with penetrating uh, trauma, they get, you know, they're lying on the ground, they're obviously bleeding from the front of their chest. Um, they get tossed on a backboard, tossed on a mattress, tossed on a cot, tossed into the ambulance and then run, run to the hospital. Um, <clears throat> but if you turn them over, this is the back of his coat. Uh, you'll notice this large gaping hole uh, that actually has crossed the midlines on that other side. So if you were just treating that anterior gunshot wound and that was all you knew about, you may do all your things there, completely ignoring that the contralateral side of his chest also has a massive injury uh, along it. <clears throat> um, and incidentally, the bullet actually went through, it hit, uh, let's see, hit two ribs, I think, um, went through his lung, hit the spine, and then exited out the, uh, out the back. So big old, <clears throat> big old wound on the back there too. Let's walk, uh, as you, you mentioned March assessment, he's gonna get a March assessment. It's all gonna, I think it's all gonna pop through here. There we go. So he's bleeding from his left chest, uh, or sorry, right chest. Yeah, bleeding from his right chest, left posterior, got that backwards. His airways patent, his breathing is labored and he has decreased breath sounds on the left side. He, his circulation appears intact in terms of his pulses and he is conscious and following commands. <clears throat> um, so what, what might you wanna do uh, now, Dave? What do, you, what do you think your priorities are at this point? So uh, if memory serves me correctly here, so we've already, uh, are you saying we've kind of made it through the March algorithm? Well, we did an assessment and we've identified those points on his, uh, um, those injuries. Yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll start with what I'm not gonna do because I actually think that that's really important. Uh, I think some people are uh, still getting really hung up on you, uh, like spinal immobilization. You mentioned that the bullet hit his spine, which we probably wouldn't know, but you might see that big um, you know, exit wound in the backs that was sort of near the spine and think, my God, he has some spinal trauma, uh, which he may in fact have, but um, let's not uh, put him on a backboard for sure. And uh, probably even skip the C collar uh, because those are not going to do anything helpful for this patient and uh, they have no therapeutic benefit and they're just going to waste time in the other things that we actually do need to do that are going to help him. So what I'd probably be doing right now is I'd probably go ahead and uh, maybe just pop an NPA in uh, because of sort of anticipated clinical course. Uh, this guy's probably going to have some trouble maintaining an airway uh, soon or maybe not. But that NPA is not going to hurt him. We can put it in pretty much anybody. We want to, you know, um, cover these holes in his uh, thorax, you know, any, any unnatural hole between neck and navel, we want to basically assume uh, communicates with the uh, 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 lungs um, and uh, go ahead and treat that as a basically, you know, almost like a sucking chest wound kind of a thing. So, you know, gloved hands right over them um, and uh, convert those to occlusive dressings. You know, if there's bleeding coming out of that back wound, that can be kind of tough to deal with. But, um, you know, you can still maybe, um, you know, do, I'm not, you're not going to want to like pack that wound because we don't really pack wounds on the torso, but you can kind of maybe put a little bit of something in there to uh, make it a little bit easier to then overlay an occlusive dressing. Um, and uh, this is definitely a patient who, you know, these days with our techniques and everything would benefit from a, a bolus of TXA and it would be relatively quick to go ahead and probably give them like, you know, two grams and a bolus, which uh, the evidence really speaks towards these days. Um, and then definitely pay attention to that trauma management. And I mean, sorry, the temperature management and get him warm and get him really nice and wrapped up. Make sure you're not just throwing a blanket over him that you're actually wrapping him up. And so, you know, like rescue blankets right against him, lofting materials around that um, and get him into a warm environment. Um, and there's some other things that we could probably be doing, but um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably stop there. I mean, the, the labored breathing and decreased breaths on the left sound uh, side, probably a you know needle chest decompression or Better yet, probably a finger thoracostomy uh, if you had that ability, um, and um, you know, pay attention to that, and uh, um, you know, be thinking that we're probably going to have to decompress this guy's chest pretty quick. I agree. So I, uh, again, we got it pretty much an equal mindset on these guys. I'm going to say let's find the hole, let's plug them if possible. Uh, his airways patent. Um, I'm going to say any hole in his chest probably needs a chest seal on it. 
um, <clears throat> that that occlusive dressing. And and I I don't know that I've ever seen an effective, truly uh, like three sided dressing that somebody's made to somebody that's come in with actual penetrating wound to their chest. I am surprised at the number of people that don't come in with any sort of um, like covering over top of their chest wound. Um, but I would advocate for putting the same thing, put a chest seal over top of whatever uh, holes there may be there. <clears throat> um, what about IV fluid? Oh, made a prediction there. Um, I would not be thinking too much about IV fluid um, at this point. Um, you know, potentially when you get into actually taking a set of vital signs and calculating a map, there might be a small need to do a, a, a fluid bolus. Um, he has lost fluids. Um, but I'd, I'd certainly be thinking more along the lines of permissive hypotension to stabilize any sorts of clots. Um, and just, we should all know at this point that, you know, lots of IV fluids for trauma patients really is not that helpful. They don't carry oxygen. Uh, they don't assist with clotting. Um, uh, you know, they're not, they're not doing it. So, you know, if you need to get pressure up, sometimes you need to get pressure up. Um, but it's really not a priority and you want to be very conservative in your fluid usage. Cool. I, uh, I predicted this response, and uh, I thought you'd feel a little st more strongly about uh, the IV fluid <clears throat> myself, but um, yeah, absolutely. Probably not a lot of IV fluid here. Uh, how are you going to plug those holes, as we kind of mentioned? So you can, you can folks ask, like, can I, can I put combat gauze into somebody's head? Like, yeah, I guess. Can I put it in somebody's belly? Yeah. Can you put it on somebody's chest? Yeah, you can. Like, there's not anything about it that's going to hurt. Um, and if that's your gauze, like, that's okay. There's just, the problem is there's just not a lot to kind of smush it down against. Um, so, yes, you can use combat gauze and hemostatic gauze. Uh, for the most part on most of these things, at least the combat gauze is okay to kind of put into any hole, more or less. It's just probably not going to be real effective on, you know, you're just going to be shoving it into uh, a hole that doesn't go anyplace. So the chest seal is really the thing. Um, now, the one question, you know, would you needle somebody after you put a chest seal on them? I know you got to get out of here and I'll, I'll make this kind of my last question. I put two chest seals. I did one on his, you know, chest over here. And then I did the one on his thorax back here. Um, he's still in respiratory distress. Would you needle this guy? Assuming that that's all that you're, that you're uh, credentialed to do at that point. So uh, first of all, I can stay for probably a few, few minutes. I notified my next commitment that uh, we're having a good time here. And we, we want to let the good times roll. Um, so I, you know, I think this is probably a very debatable question um, that there is not necessarily a, a lot of clear guidance or, or evidence on. Um, I think that I would still needle him. And my rationale would be that your chest seals are really making sure that we're not just like sucking a lot of volume into the thorax and, you know, causing the problems that we know that that causes. But if air is still building up, if we still have a tension pneumothorax, we do have to deal with that somehow. And so I would like to try to control that situation by plugging up holes that shouldn't be there and then doing whatever decompressions need to be done to try to deal with whatever air is still trapped. So I'd want to sort of shut the barn door on air coming in um, and then be able to, you know, essentially vent off whatever air uh, I need to vent off. The particular occlusive dressing that you're showing there um, you know, has these little vents built into them. Um, but it's really kind of a lot of mixed evidence on how effective those really are. You're going to find a lot of occlusive dressing, commercial occlusive dressings that don't have those because of that, that kind of wishy-washy evidence base. We are really getting away from the, uh, you know, kind of three and a half sided improvised dressings where you leave a little flap to burp. So I think what the bulk of the evidence, and I could be a little bit behind on this, but I really think what the bulk of the evidence really says is that um, you know, just a, 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 a non-vented occlusive dressing is really going to be superior. Quick caveat to that is that there's also some interesting evidence that you need some channels in the occlusive dressing to drain blood, because if blood starts building up essentially almost like a hematoma under that occlusive dressing, it can displace the occlusive dressing by essentially ruining the adhesive. So allowing a little bit of blood to trickle out so you don't lose your occlusive that's a different thing than having vents to actually, you know, vent the air, which tends not to work. So that's my thought on that. Like it. Yeah. So something like a high, maybe a high vent or something like that. Or um, you don't have fancy occlusive dressings on your service. All you have is Asherman's, which suck. Um, maybe AD pads. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, I'm totally with you. My, I, 
you know, we talk about this sometimes because like, well, you put a three, you put a dressing on it, but that's, you know, it's already letting the air out. The problem is like, eh, you don't know that it's letting the air out. You don't know that gunshot wound was not a particularly like surgically clean wound. It could have resealed itself and be building up tension underneath it. Um, <clears throat> it, it. There's lots of lots of reasons that the person still may be even in, you know, having a having an open chest wound does not necessarily mean that you have an open pneumothorax. So I agree. I would put the chest seals on. And at that point, though, the patient may get a lot better. If the patient gets a lot better with just the chest seals on. I might kind of stop there. Um, because while we don't think about it, once you actually cover that, uh, if they're able to generate that negative pressure again, they may actually breathe a whole lot better. And I think that gets ignored a lot. So the chest seal is as important as the uh, needle, in my opinion, for penetrating trauma to the torso. Um, but the needle still may be important because you don't know what's building up in there. So I, I would, I'm totally with you. There, there's an interesting thing that you, I think you, you sort of touched on this and maybe you just said it and I wasn't kind of fully paying attention, but the idea of tissue shifting. So if we consider this wound pattern and if it's true, in fact, that he was like, you know, waving and he has arm up. So we have all my tissue here sort of stretched out. I get shot. I fall backwards and collapse and probably go somewhat flaccid. All this tissue sort of falls down. And so we can have this big hole, but we, you know, sort of sucked a lot of air into that initial wound. And then the, the and then the tissue shifts down again. And now we basically have a tension uh, pneumothorax sort of a situation where even though there's a large hole in my chest that should be communicating air and maybe even essentially equalizing pressure, um, it's not going to do that because that tunnel just sort of collapsed on itself when my pectoral tissues uh, just fell down. True that, exactly. Now I know we are kind of getting to the end of it here and I'll, I'll sort of wrap it up. Honestly, that was, that's kind of, you know, sums up the most of what I'd probably do for this person. Um, We'll say that his vital signs look more or less okay. I kind of talked about his wound pattern already uh, in that it you know transmits through his chest uh, and then comes out the backside and you can't see that because it's can, you, can you go back to those vitals real quick? Yep. Um, this is, this is pre-intervention, okay. by the way. Gotcha. So... Um, this guy's shock index is pretty high. He's approaching, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. Meaning, and shock index, of course. So his SPO2 is not great. His shock index is high. If my calculation is correct, he has a shock index of about one, right uh, which yep. means that he is probably already in shock. Seems to be compensating, but definitely, uh, which means that he is probably definitely in shock. Agreed, yeah. And certainly he got shot through the chest and uh, um, that's what we might expect. <clears throat> um, all right, we talked about new needling this cat already. Uh, potentially, I, I would probably do that, especially in, like you said, that sign of potentially, is it hemorrhagic shock, is it obstructive shock? Uh, who cares, let's, let's treat both uh, at least and see if one seems to make better sense. And then uh, I thought I would throw this out here as well. Um, I totally agree. It's time to go to the hospital now. Should this guy go on a backboard? Absolutely, he should not, I don't think. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, again, I'm speaking, speaking for you, Professor, but uh, I think you would agree with this statement that uh, we shouldn't even be like asking anymore about whether or not this person needs to be boarded and collared. Yep. And I would, I would just point out, I'm, um, uh, I have, let's see, is, uh, is Gary Hall still on the line here? He is. Okay, so so Gary is one of our uh, adjunct instructors at Eastern, and we are both uh, about to wrap up our EMT classes this semester. Our EMTs at Eastern are going to test on their skills in a couple of weeks, and it's just a kind of a reminder that um, spinal and supine immobilization are not even registry skill sessions anymore, skill stations anymore for EMT or paramedic. Um, you know, the National Registry uh, sort of notoriously uh, kind of conservative. And I think a lot of people would, would critique them as being um, definitely not on the leading curve of, of evidence. Um, they have finally just removed the stations entirely. Now we still have to teach our students how to do the procedure because you still have to know how to do it. It is still out there and we might still use a backboard as a lifting and moving device. And if you put somebody on a backboard, you need to strap them onto it so they don't fall off. So, you know, we've gone from drilling our students over and over and over and over and over again, how to put somebody on a backboard 
um, to basically saying, hey, here's how you put some backboard, make sure these Velcro straps are in place, right? Like log roll them, put them on it. It's not that big of a deal. And that's just a reminder, I think, to everybody that the consensus at this point really is that there is no therapeutic role for spine boards. Handy for lifting and moving, do absolutely nothing for the patient's injuries. And I just realized that you couldn't see me nodding um, vigorously in approval, but uh, uh, yes, yes. All right, so could we save him? What's your, what's your thought with appropriate care? You think this is a survivable injury? Uh, yeah, I mean, potentially survivable, sure. I mean, I think we have limited information about really the extent of the injuries internally. That sort of transverse uh, thoracic uh, cavitating wound is generally not great, <laughs> but um, you know, I mean, you just really have to know a little bit more about um, what's going on inside. Um, and and uh, and so, yeah, is it is it is it potentially survivable? I think yes, um, although mortality does tend to be high with it. Um, the the thing that I noticed about those initial vitals is that you know he is compensating. So his shock index was high. Um, and I think we could probably all just assume he's in shock to begin with. His map was not amazing. When you do the map calculation on 120 over 95, I think it comes out to something like 67. Uh, I might have to run those numbers again or look at those vitals again, but that was the initial map calculation I got, which is getting a little not so great. Um, and so, um, you know, again, this is somebody who definitely needs, you know, resuscitation with blood products and, um, you know, a trauma surgeon, um, at, at, but, but nevertheless still perfusing, you know, end organ perfusion is still, is still, you know, happening. And then the other thing you notice that I think we look past a lot with vital signs is that that was a narrowing pulse pressure, right? So 120 over 95 is starting to narrow from that kind of textbook range of, you know, like 120 over 80. So we have a narrowing pulse pressure. The reason that's happening is that his body is squirting out a bunch of adrenaline to uh, try to increase systemic vascular resistance. So your diastolic pressure is starting to rise. Um, but although that is an early sign of shock when you see that narrowing pulse pressure, it's also kind of good news in the sense that his body is still able to address the insult. He is in compensated rather than decompensated shock. So if we can act quickly and we can get him to a definitive care facility where they can probably just go ahead and crack open that chest um, and start repairing some stuff and transfuse a lot of blood, maybe very survivable. If we dilly dally and we wait and he goes from compensating to decompensating, um, he's probably I also, uh, again, agree. Um, and uh, the reason I ask too, could we save him? You know, final thing. Um, interestingly enough, penetrating trauma to the chest, if they are alive when you get there, they've got a decent shot. Uh, because if it takes you, you know, six, seven minutes to get to the place and he hasn't, um, it, he hasn't arrested already, there's a pretty decent chance that it didn't hit his aorta and it didn't hit his heart because he's still alive. Um, so these folks are, are potentially salvageable. Um, so this is where like the trauma, oh man, should we work this guy? Uh, he's, you know, it's a shot, he's shot in the chest. This is a mortal wound. Well, not anymore. It's not, um, <clears throat> especially if you can get him to the hospital and heck this guy lived, this guy lived long enough to get sworn in as governor and eat oysters afterwards. Uh, <clears throat> um, these are not necessarily incompatible with life. So we should, uh, we should work these guys hard and we should, uh, do everything we can for him because this is one that you could, you can pull out of this. Um, so my kind of main points to this one were, you remember the bodies in shock tend to go to ambient temperature. And if that ambient temperature is 80 degrees, then they're going to be 80 degrees, which is too cold. Uh, so remember to heat these guys up, penetrating trauma, you find all the holes and then you plug them, uh, use the chest seal as well as the needles, uh, potentially, just because they've got a hole doesn't mean it's a good hole. So make sure that hole is the right hole for you. And then there's no immobilization for penetrating trauma. Um, so, uh, Professor, any, uh, any other stuff you want to uh, sum up with or uh, otherwise, that's about what I've got on this topic for right now. Yeah, I think I would just say, um, really don't give short shrift to this hypothermia thing. It's a really big deal. It doesn't have to be cold for it to happen. You know, your blood is basically like motor oil and it's one of its functions in that sense is to distribute heat to the rest of your body. 
So if you're supposed to have 98.6 or thereabouts circulating through all the different parts of your body, and now you don't, then you're not going to be able to maintain 98.6. And it only takes really just a couple of degrees drop in the patient's body temp for their mortality rates to essentially triple. So you got to really like for real, keep them warm. And what I see a lot is people just saying, okay, we'll get them inside a warm ambulance or, well, it's really hot outside. Um, I, you know, you still have to wrap these patients up in a thermal barrier and get them into a actively warmed environment. So, you know, I think the classic lesson that a lot of people get taught, uh, hopefully at least during kind of their initial training and we forget about sometimes is like, they keep the trauma operating rooms pretty warm. And that's because for one thing, they're tipping, typically opening people up. Right. And, and, and so that's a whole other issue. But the point is like when they're doing trauma surgery, it's pretty, it's pretty stuffy in there. We need to do the same thing. So assuming that you have a working thermostat in the back of your ambulance, which I know might be <laughs> a little bit of a, <laughs> a, a wishful thinking in some places, but if you have a working thermostat in the back of your ambulance, the, what the literature really says is that you want to put that up to 85 degrees. And that is the temperature at which the patient's no longer going to be losing heat um, if they are um, basically naked. So that's what the literature is about. If you have like a naked person laying in a room, 85 degrees is what it needs to be so that they're not basically just uh, transferring heat from their core out to that ambient environment. So, you know, one of the teaching points we get taught a lot is like, if you're not sweating, it's too cold for your trauma patient or not warm enough for your trauma patient. That's never been really helpful to me because it's like, uh, you know, like I, I, I sweat pretty easily. Like I get a little sweaty, just getting excited and stepping up into the back of the ambulance, you know, um, uh, with my own adrenaline pumping. So um, it's not, you know, if you're sweating, it's warm enough. It's like, what is the temperature in that space? And that temperature should be 85 degrees. So um, make the back of your ambulance really, really stuffy. Um, and, um, you know, make sure that you're wrapping up the entire patient like a baked potato and not just like draping a blanket over their front half, but the whole back half of their body is still subject to conductive heat loss through whatever they're laying on. Love it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, definitely appreciate you, um, being on and like letting me, um, kind of ambush you into this, but, uh, uh, Professor David Pfeiffer from uh, EKU. If you want a uh, great, if you're an EMT and you're looking for a place to get a medic um, <clears throat> education, I I would pick there, uh, honestly. And I'm not just not just blowing smoke up there because he did a nice thing for me here, but I certainly do appreciate it. I agree, uh, and I didn't want to leave our other faculty member present on this uh, Zoom out as well. Um, we want to thank uh, Scott McCowan. I was looking for a make sure he didn't drop off. I want to thank Scott McCowan for. He's one of our clinical preceptors, and he's been shepherding a lot of our paramedic students through their clinical rotations uh, this semester. Uh, so much love to my uh, fellow colonel teachers on the Zoom uh, and all you do for our students. Awesome. Well, thank you, guys. Um, and for everybody else, let's take...